Okay, hello everyone. I'm going to try something different today. I'm still fumbling around trying to master this medium. And my last couple of videos were about 40 minutes long each. And that's about the length of a classroom lecture. Why would you want to hear somebody talk for 40 minutes? I, anyway, so I'm going to aim for uh, something significantly shorter. Let's see if I can keep this under 10 minutes. And I'm going to be slightly more focused, more tightly focused, addressing just a narrower concept. So in this case, I want to talk about a basic concept in developmental biology, positional information. How does a cell on your fingertip know it's in a finger and not on your elbow? I know, that's a fundamental piece of information that we all tend to take for granted. We don't have fingertips on our elbows, and we don't have elbows on our fingertips. Uh, our body parts are formed in the right place, mostly. So one could imagine that one way we could manage this is if our bodies are mapped on a three-dimensional grid of some sort. So a cell could just read off its location on that grid and figure out where it is. So if, it's, if a cell can see that it's 68 centimeters from the shoulder, it knows it must be in a fingertip. On the other hand, if it's 33 centimeters from the shoulder, it must be in an elbow. That's a simple scheme for doing this. But how does it determine that? And what tells a cell where it is? One among many explanations is, is handled by what's called the French flag model that uh, Louis Wolpert came up with many decades ago. Uh, there's nothing special about the French flag. It's just a very simple example with only three bands of color, blue, white, and red. If a flag were an organism, all a cell would need in order to determine the configuration of that particular flag is its distance from the flagpole. Once it knows how far it is from the flagpole, it knows whether it's supposed to be blue, white, or red. So it reduces everything to a simple one-dimensional problem, which is nice for a model, uh, with only three possible outcomes, blue, white, or red. So it's très simple. So here's Walpert's simple model. I'll just show you what that looks like. Okay, imagine that there's a source for a chemical at the flagpole, and the chemical diffuses the width of the flag, getting weaker and weaker the farther it goes. This chemical is called a morphogen. All an individual cell needs to do is look at its environment and measure how much morphogen is present. If there's lots, it must be near the flagpole. It must be intended to be blue. If very little, it must be out at the far end of the flag. It must be intended to be red. And if it's in between, in between it's in that white middle region. So that's, that's a really simple way to explain how a cell figures out where it is. Uh, let's look at this model graphically, however. So this graph is plotting the concentration of the morphogen as a function of the distance from the source, in this case, the flagpole. It looks easy. The cell just reads the signal of the morphogen and uses that to specify which color gene they should turn on. But how does a cell read, you might ask? Uh, one idea is that there, the morphogen binds to receptors on the cell's surface in a graded quantitative way. So all the cell has to do is measure the number of receptors that are bound to signal and translate that into a pattern of gene activity. I'm trying to keep this simple, can, but you can already tell there are hidden depths here. So how do bound receptors turn on genes? One way is if the bound receptor activates transcription factors, that is, proteins that bind to regulatory regions of DNA. These activated transcription factors bind to switches on the DNA that turns on specific genes. So, for instance, the blue gene is switched on if there are lots and lots of transcription factors binding to their regulatory DNA. If there are lots of transcription factors, blue is turned on. But if there are a few transcription factors, as we see with the low concentration of the transcriptional regulator, um, the signal isn't strong enough, so blue is turned off. Other genes might be easier to switch on, so like the th low threshold gene, there would be, for instance, the red gene in the flag. Uh, they require a lower threshold of the transcription factors, 
So red is active even when the signal is weak. Of course, do you see a problem with this model as shown here? Uh, this particular model would have red switched on everywhere across the entire length of the flag. And blue would only be turned on at the far left end. And white would be turned on in the middle and also out to the far right end. Uh, what that means is that our flag would not be blue, white, red. It would be purplish and then pink and then red, uh, which is not a very French flag at all. Uh, so to explain this, we have to invoke some Boolean logic in gene regulation, uh, which is probably a bit much to get into today, so I'll just briefly mention it. Uh, suffice to say that there are regulatory elements that are inhibited by high concentrations. In fact, there are a whole bunch of regulatory elements and a lot of transcription factors that are jockeying for the control of gene expression, and it's reasonably easy to assemble a control circuit that builds something analogous to the French flag without purples and pinks in it. So we should increase the complexity of this model just a little bit, and it would also be nice if I talked about some real examples instead of this flag model, because Flags aren't really organisms. Okay, so let's, let's look at a fruit fly. So what you see here is on the left, uh, there's this big circle, uh, and what that is a, is a cross-section through the embryo of Drosophila. And the smaller circles that you see within it that are colored different shades of green are the uh, nuclei of the syncytial cells of that embryo. Dorsal is a gene product that defines the ventral side of the embryo. Don't ask about the name. That's something different. Okay, and it works by being present in every cell. Not shown here, but it's present in every single cell. But it only translates, translocates to the nuclei of the ventral cells where it turns on some other genes. So what are some of those other genes that it's switching on? Uh, among those are twist, and snail. Twist and snail are mesodermal markers. They're also found in vertebrates. So these, these are genes that are going to be switched on to activate basically muscle connective tissue sorts of fates. So dorsal is going to make, the dorsal side of the embryo is going to make epidermis. The ventral side, the very ventral side, is going to make muscle and connective tissue. Um, and this diagram shows you how they interact. So we see dorsal and green with arrows pointing down to twist and snail. Uh, this is called a coherent feed-forward loop because dorsal turns on twist and it turns on snail and twist also turns on snail. So all of these are feeding forward in one massive battery of signals that all work to activate snail strongly in the ventral part of the animal. Okay, if you look over to the right, though, there's, an, there's another diagram. It's a little more complicated, and that's because there is another gene we need turned on, and it's called VND. VND is short for ventral nervous system defective. VND is going to activate the formation of the ner nervous system, which at this stage is found in two lateral stripes to either side of that mesodermal region, and eventually it's going to fold in and the stripes will fuse to make the single ventral midline, but again, we won't worry about that right now. Uh, anyway, look at that diagram. My head's in the way, but I'll move to the side. Look at that diagram, and you see that what we have is an incoherent feed-forward loop, and that is dorsal turns on twist, dorsal turns on snail, and dorsal turns on VND. But snail turns off VND. See, right away we get into a more complicated circuit. So what's going on here is that uh, we're going to inhibit VND in some places, in the, in the very midline, ventral midline, and it's going to be activated laterally where sna snail is not so strongly expressed where the nervous system is supposed to form. So it, it leads us into a more complicated situation where some inputs turn genes on, others turn genes off, it makes a lot of complexity possible with fairly simple circuits of gene regula regulation. And that's clever, right? Trust me, though, this is, this is a simple network. This is a really simple network of Boolean logic. Uh, there are much more complicated ones. 
I'm going to end this though with just one more example. I'm trying to keep this under 10 minutes, remember. Uh, so one more example. This one's an invertebrate because who cares about flies, right? You don't care about flies. So what we see here is on the left, that's a cross section through the spinal cord of something, a chick, a mouse, a zebrafish, a person. They all work pretty much the same way. In this case, the morphogen is known as sonic hedgehog. And sonic hedgehog is produced by the notochord. That's that big N you see over there in the circle. And it's also produced by the ventral floor plate, which is that kind of brown triangle you see at the bottom middle of the, of the spinal cord. Uh, once again, like a classic morphogen, sonic diffuses from its source. It diffuses upwards, so it gets weaker and weaker as it gets farther and farther dorsal. Uh, and it produces a concentration gradient that's highest at the bottom and weaker at the top. In this case, that gradient is going to produce far more than blue, white, and red cells. Um, there's a whole range of cell, cell types that are induced at different concentrations of sonic hedgehog. Uh, so we're going to make motor neurons, that's the MN there, but we're also going to make all these different inner neurons that contribute to the complexity of the spinal cord, uh, one of my favorite organs ever. And what we're seeing here is that by this gradient, and also I have to emphasize by a great many other cell signaling pathways, uh, we can generate multiple cell types in a single tissue. So gradients can be a powerful tool for organisms to use to generate diverse cell types. Now, let me just wrap this up then. Um, there are lots of places to learn more about these concepts. Any developmental biology textbook will discuss them at great length. It's a very popular subject. Uh, most of the images I used here were pulled out of an excellent review article by Catherine Rogers and Alex Shear. There's the reference to that. You can go look it up. It goes into much greater detail than I have, and it gives plenty of examples, and it also gives many more details on molecular regulatory mechanisms, so it's a good path to get started on digging deeper into these, these gene regulatory networks. If you want, I have a blog at Freethought Blog. Stop by and chat with the gang there, um, and I can also be reached by email anytime. Thanks for listening.